Hello and welcome back to another episode of Beyond Flutter, the podcast about Flutter, coding, software engineering and everything that is important. So today we have a fantastic new episode where we are talking about a very important topic. We will talk about the importance of being a versatile developer. What does that mean? Why do you need to do it? And why it is important for us developers especially? All right, but before we begin and make a deep dive into our main topic today, we want to give us a little bit of a channel update or what I'm currently doing. So what is Flutter Explained Max Weber is currently up to? So first of all, next month, I will be at the FlutterCon with my favorite topic, the beautiful world of Flutter testing. And I'm allowed to give there again a fantastic talk, hopefully, where I introduce all the different funky things. Thanks to Code Magic, they invited me there and said, hey, do you want to participate there and, and do some work with us? And I said, yes, of course, with pleasure. And now I will be there. And that's a great opportunity for me because I love to be there. And I also wanted to create, get a new camera. And this is the perfect timing to do that. And yeah, test that out, how it works. Maybe have some interviews with amazing Flutter colleagues there. And I can't wait to start this episode. So if you want to be there, it's from the 5th to the 7th July. It's full day. So that will be great. I will arrive at the 4th by train. And it's in Berlin, Germany. So if you are wanting to join, that's the perfect time to be there. Don't miss my talk. As I said, the beautiful world of testing. Some of you probably know it already. I gave it on Geekly, but I'm still happy to give it once more and give get more direct feedback from the people because it was always remote so far. And it would be amazing to see some people against it. And it's also one of my very first paid public speaking events. That's something that I'm very proud of because if I go somewhere and I get yeah paid even for it to make what I love, talking about development, then that's even better. So if you are interested in having me as a speaker at your event, always reach out to me. All right, so what do I do personally? I work currently on our new website, free.o, I want to say it, because, yeah, the website was always a side project, and it's always that I would love to take a framework like Vix or Webflow, which are supporting the development of websites very much because you have like a, a set of tools that you can just drag and drop and you have it directly ready. But, you know, I am a developer and engineer, so I think always I can do it myself. The last time I just bought Gatsby, how do you call it, a Gatsby uh, template, but I was so frustrated with it. It has so many flaws. It was so hard to update. I was not even able to just set a new site for it and just add a new page for it because it was so cumbersome. So I decided to get rid of that stuff and make something that I have knowledge about, make it beautiful. And if I want to have a design or something, yeah, just uh, do it yourself and create everything. So the second thing was what I want to use as a technology. As you know, my uh, former knowledge was being a web developer. So I should have used, or I thought about Angular and React, which one I wanted to choose. So I decided for React right now, it's uh, way more lightweight and with Next.js. Why Next.js? I hope in the long run that I can use the backend environment to create also some kind of authentication, make it possible to log in and maybe even pay per Stripe. That would mean that you can then order my mentorship program via Stripe directly from my website. And I already implemented that as a test balloon and I was very surprised how easy it is. I was very happy how beautiful it is because I use their uh, Flowbyte from Tailwind CSS, which looks just stunning. And I'm in general a big fan of Tailwind. I was really surprised how easy it is to add new CSS classes and make things more beautiful. And as you see, all of that already aligns perfectly to our new topic that we have today. But we don't want to go there right now. The next topic that I would like to talk about is the mentorship program itself. As you probably know already, I have a mentorship program. It is quite fresh now since one month where I do it actively again because I had some very interesting mentees that are just joining and paying money and were never there, which is like the best case that you can have. But I was very 
very sad with that because I could not, first of all, I prepared the sessions. Second of all, I did not really feel like I earned that money. I just received something. It was like a donation, but ugly. So I decided to cancel these subscriptions. And as you knew, I also did not really promote this mentorship program, but this changed this month. And I got two fantastic mentees that do a fantastic job. I'm really proud of them because they brought their own project and they wanted to achieve something. They directly invest time in it. They show me that they want to learn something. And I got some fantastic testimonials which I am able to put on my website and that is really a great thing for me so I'm really happy to have these two and I hope really that yeah that makes a difference for both of us so like that they learn what they need to learn for the future and I am able to yeah sustain myself so that's always a good thing right also I learn also a lot because uh, some of these questions are really tricky and I have to really google it myself so I learned for example a lot about Firebase function how they work and I did not know for example that you can put a whole express server on Firebase functions which is pretty crazy so even my backend skills are getting now better and better yeah so if you search for a mentor mentor at the moment there are still free places available I would be loving to have you there so the next topic would be the WWDC 23 and I am not sure if you are aware of it but la yesterday there was a lot of happening in the Apple space and they shook up the, the whole VR space again with their new VR glasses and I found that super interesting and I was really surprised because Meta, the uh, big business behind Facebook, they go into the VR probabilities and they thought to make that great and I think Steam with their Steam Valve and things, they also tried to make VR like main mainstream but until now it was not really possible easily i was surprised by the announcement because the hardware that it has is huge there is so many stuff like the m2 and i think they have created the r1 another processor which is good for parallel development and they have some cool stuff like eye tracking that everything else doesn't even getting rendered and I don't know, stuff like that. And I you can now see your face in front of it. So other people are not so surprised if they don't see you with a mask on. It feels weird for me because, well, you have a VR headset on the head. So why would anyone else care if you look at them or not? But you know, it's, it is there. So it's Apple, they do things a little bit different. But what I found very interesting is that they created a whole OS system for it. And what does that mean is that in the future, if Flutter wants still to be platform independent for everything, then it could be that we see sooner or later maybe some interesting development that Flutter tries to get into the VR space and getting into that space and tries to adapt also to that OS. This is now a long shot, a very long shot, and don't believe that this happens anytime soon. But it would be very funky to create apps for, for this VR headset because what I saw is that you can, for example, yeah, shut off your Mac, oh, MacBook and only use the VR headset to play with it. And they had some cool functions with that. So check out the uh, quick session of it. I loved it and it helped me to understand what they want to achieve. Besides of that, there were also, course, also other devices. I don't want to talk about that too much. Uh, pretty boring, actually. I am myself a, hard, uh, an, a macOS user and I love it to work with. But I would never suggest to, if you don't really work with it and you don't need the power to get a Mac, it's way too expensive. Just stick with a Windows PC. Usually that's uh, the better option. Okay, so now I made all the Apple fanboys my enemy. I think now we can slowly start with our main topic tonight. So versatility is the ability to adapt or be adapted to many different functions or activities. So that is yeah, a short definition that I found online as everyone else nowadays. And that sounds already something like, yeah, don't ask for that. That's clear for me that we need to be versatile and we should know all the tools and we should be able to get to our employee and just start working whatever project or, or work he is throwing at us. But there is more to it, actually, because 
some people think that it directly stops there. So I want to give you a short overview of what means versatility for me personally. So if you think about, I was starting as an SAP developer, which coded in the programming language ABAP. And I really thought this is how programmers are working and how they are living their lives. So they just sit in front of their computer, writing code, bring that somehow in the internet and someone clicks on the stuff. But that changed slightly because there was a colleague of mine who helped me to learn JavaScript also a little bit in that time. And he gave me the introduction into a whole new world, the web. Suddenly everything was beautiful. You could make animations. It was very rare and far away from that what we can do now. <laughs> I guess it was already a lot, but you know, with all the frameworks nowadays, it's different. So that was already the first time where I saw, okay, it seems that there are more things to it. You know, it's not enough that I know how these one ecosystem is working and, and know how to write code for it. There is even more in the development, right? And the digital age. Then I switched to a consulting career and then it got it really funky. At consulting level, everything got now important. My first thing that I did was making a so-called SOA certification, SOA certification. And that is still valid nowadays because SOA is in a lot of architectures there, but many people don't even know it. And <laughs> even though I made this certification, I actually never used the tool for which I have made this SOA certification because it was an Oracle tool and I never did that in my life again. I found then a project uh, in the Switzerland where I worked closely and only for a so-called CRM system, Siebel, where I was able to use my JavaScript skills and create stuff in OpenUI. So there I was funky because in the consultant career, you travel a lot usually, and I had a lot of time evenings in the hotel. So I started learning things. And what I did is I did tutorials for JavaScript. And that sounds funny because even though I was already very good in JavaScript, I learned all the time something new because even though that you have done these tutorials already or you make three or four different tutorials, you always get more nuances. You still understand more and more. So one tip that I can give you if you want to learn really something well to just make tutorials even twice, that helps you. So for example, if you have a tutorial or a whole training session, like for example, Angela Yu, for me, it was the first uh, touch point with Flutter. I made this course twice. The first time I made it right at the beginning so that I learned Flutter and get into it. But then two and three years later, I did it again just to see if I really remembered everything well and I understood everything well. And even though I felt myself already an advanced or professional Flutter developer, that helped me to really settle down the knowledge, understood that I got really better in that knowledge, but I already found some stuff that I already forgot again. So that makes sense. But now where comes the versatility again? Yeah, you see, I learned a lot of programming languages and later that helped me tons because I am now able to discuss with people around different technology levels. I can talk with Java developers because I did that a while. I can talk with ABAP developers Developers. And you don't know how many companies there are who have a very broad tech stack. And it helps you always if you can discuss with different teams, you get more knowledge from them, have some ideas, it helps you to exchange. And later I did that even on a higher level that I got to designers and talk with designers about their problems and things like that. And that gave me some advantages, but I want to, uh, don't want to go too fast over that. So that are just my personal opinions. And then there was a very interesting thing that happened to me. I am, or I was at the beginning, a full front-end developer in Angular 2. And a colleague of mine, Steffen, greetings if you hear that, he and I talked a little bit about front-end stuff. And I said at one point, okay, this is now back-end stuff, you do it. And he said, hey, well, we are one team. You cannot just say this is now your stuff. You don't care anymore. And that was very, how do you say it, enlightened to me because that was the point where I said, okay, he's absolutely right. Uh, if you are working in a team and you want to deliver something together, 
you cannot just make a cut at front and back end. You should know about the whole product. And that was from then on my mantra to really understand what I'm developing and how I can help myself on front and back end parts. So this makes me, of course, quite versatile because now I'm a Flutter developer, content creator, public speaker and whatnot, trainer for teams and yeah, but all that was just learning the whole time. So continuous learning is really important for me. And I think that makes the examples clear. Yeah. So what does that help us now? Well, the tech landscape in the world is changing every two years, I would say completely. Like from the one day there is a CRM tools, the most coolest thing ever, like customer relationship to management tools. But then later, maybe it's AR, VR, AI. There is always a next a hype train that moves the other. If you check the Gartner curve, which is a fantastic, I think they are themselves consultants. So if you watch Gartner there, they always publish every year where the hype cycle is. And I think the interesting part here was, for example, for AI, the hype cycle was not, <laughs> not even existed. They jumped over all the cycles more or less right now because it was such a big hype train. But it's crazy. So it, it, that you want to learn all of these or that you want to get a deep understanding. But that's interesting because even though that you want to generalize, you want to hear all the topics, you want to know about them because customers will come to you. They will ask you maybe. They will give you some yeah, tasks for a specific part. Maybe a different team has questions. So you have suddenly the, the work that, hey, how can we integrate AI into our tool? And suddenly you're standing there and can say, okay, I've never heard about AI. I don't know what it does. I don't know how ChatGPT is working. Well, that will not be sufficient you know they want experts and you are an expert usually or you are at least uh, perceived as an expert even that you don't see it that way and with that you have a uh, similar obligations you will have to say okay i want to know that and i want to get at least a thing uh, a thumb toe is that correct i don't know your foot into the water to really help your customers that does not mean that you should ignore specialization. Quite the opposite. I love that because nowadays, without specialists, our world would look completely different. But especially in, in development and inside of programming, it's always very interesting how helpful special versatility is. But let's have a look into specialization. Why is it important to have one important topic that you love and that you are the expert in and from there you try to create your versatility well first of all it allows you to get be a really expert in that field and people will ask you questions to it and additionally it will help you also to understand surrounding topics so i for myself see myself mostly as a developer and a solution architect which helps me to create architectures and write code on a diff on a specific level I am not a perfect developer. That means I am not so specialized that I would say that I can solve all the lead codes today or something like that. But I would say I'm good enough to understand it and bring it into the business. So I feel myself as that, you call it business engineer thing, so between the business and the development side. And that helped me already often because as a usual developer for applications, you just sit there and usually do some weird useless tasks like coloring takes and changing something like that or yeah it's usually quite easy and not so complex like on lead code but it helped me to for example come to my to my product owners and say to them okay look at that there is a date field we have this and this option and i knew how to communicate with these people because i knew what their incentive is so they want to earn money with that tool or they their job is to make that tool as productive as possible and as good as possible so I know exactly how I can pro give them the best solution. And most of the time people really like that from my side. So I highly recommend you to at least try it to always come with options. Never tell them something is not working. Even if you tell them it is very expensive to implement, 
you know, development, everything is possible, nothing is impossible. But back to the topic specialization, I'm so sorry, it's uh, the first time without script, so I'm jumping a little bit about the topics, I think that, uh, I hope that's okay, just have here some bullet points. Yeah, uh, so if you have a broader topic about knowledge about one thing, that is amazing because people will perceive you as expert and will come to you and ask you questions and sometimes more questions than you like and yeah. But that helps you to get uh, this real grasp of a solution. You really dig in the dirt, you know, you can so solve problems that other people never have seen before. And that is really confidence creating and it makes you also very efficient. But let's say you would like to help others too. You would like to have a, a team that is very productive, not only one hero, because there is one saying in English, right? Heroes don't scale. That means if you have a hero in your team, they can be very beneficial because they solve problems very quick, very fast, very professional, but they also always come with the bus problem. If you don't know the bus problem, well, Tomorrow there is a bus for him, you know, the, he could run over by a bus and with that you lose that hero, you lose that knowledge and you lose also the performance in your team in the worst case. So that sounds very awful and I'm sorry for that, but you know, that is a thing, you know, if you don't come tomorrow to work, then someone else has to maybe do it. And with that you have a big problem. Also, there is another problem. What is with empathy? Let's say a develop DevOps team come to you and say, hmm, sorry, guys, I can't publish your app tomorrow. And suddenly everyone is, what? We need to be deploying tomorrow. It's not possible and things like that. If you have a basic understanding of the DevOps team, maybe you know about their problems. You understand why they can't deploy things and maybe have done it yourself you will have much more empathy with this person and you will be able to find solution with him. Because what happens often is that people start to blame persons or blame uh, whole departments for not doing their job right, which is most of the case not the real reason people don't want to do what you would like to have. So I would be stressing that a little bit be empathetic with others and as i said versatility can help you with that so let's switch over to the benefits of versatility first of all it increases employability what does that mean well if you have the knowledge of angular c sharp .NET framework you maybe know Ang uh, the react native you know flutter you know go with all these programming languages, if you have even a basic understanding of the things, it's way easier to perceive a new job because you can, of course, be in multiple regions and marketing parts. That only uh, that is not only restricted to technology, right? If you have business understanding, like for example me, I feel myself always as a generalist. I have worked in six different industries in my life so far and I'm pretty sure that, yeah, I hope that's that now, For but let's see. And this is still changing from time to time. And in these industries, I have now a basic understanding. So if that helps me, of course, to find a job in each of these industries. So if I go to automotive industry, I can tell, hey, I worked three years in that industry and please employ me. Yeah, I have knowledge. Or if I go to uh, a different business where there is telecommunications set, then I can go there and say, hey, I have knowledge in that field and people will like that because business knowledge is usually a big plus in every interview uh, if you are not going for full tech thing like Google or something like that. Okay, the next thing is you have better problem solving skills. If you know that there is a DevOps and you know there will be a pipeline, then probably you will be able to solve problems before you even create them. Maybe when you start a new project, you can think about, hey, let's maybe use Docker <laughs> because DevOps will love you for that. that. That is directly for them. Okay, if you have used Docker with uh, Kubernetes or something, then they directly can push all the things. You are, will be more easier creating solutions for bigger problems. Next is the capacity for innovation, I would call it. The reason is, if you know about a lot of different areas, you are not only a one-trick pony, and this helps you to be innovative, to create new solutions, 
to find um, better solutions better even. And all of that helps you to really innovate things and maybe come up with solutions that have not been there before. Such as, for example, a new framework for JavaScript. I mean, everyone loves a new framework for JavaScript, right? Yeah, the one point that I already gave is the having more empathy with each other, because I think that is very important, especially in development. I think there is too much miscommunication nowadays with remote work. It's getting even harder. And it makes you as a developer even more resilient. If you know more about different ideas, knowledges, and probably also different areas, that makes you as a developer way more resilient about opinions of other people. So not that you don't accept them anymore, but you will be more lighthearted taking them without being grudged about a technology decision or something, or you don't have fears that there is a new framework that you use and the team has decided for it. And now you sit there and said, oh no, I have never heard about it. So how can I do that? Now I have to learn again all these things. If you have a basic understanding of a lot of things, that helps you with that very much, especially if there are new frameworks like JavaScript every day. Another point that I really like to say is researching for new projects are easier. That is something I found interesting because that helped me when I was in New Zealand and working for a company there. Then the people were saying to me that they made a project research. They got like 14 days or even a month or something for a new project because it needed to be successful. So they had the chance to really research different technologies and different approaches. They were thinking about monolith and not monolith and things like that. And anti-corruption pattern, they were allowed to really create a fantastic architectural design and things like that. And they were really superior with that. And during that research, I found out that the one that got accepted because there were like three teams that created these researches and in between these three teams they had to decide and there was one team that at the end got the okay we do it this way and there were more versatile members in it like there was one from devops there was one from a development team one from the business partners and they like had very much better communication skills in general that led to this broader knowledge they shared this knowledge with each other and they were not afraid of of different people opinions and this brings me maybe to a next episode topic because it would be great to what makes an efficient team i think google made there a lot of research and it would be great to read into that and give you some perspectives about that yeah so that is the effectiveness and marketability i think i got all these points problem solving skills but now that's great right you want now to be versatile from now on, everything should be versatile. You know, you are a junior developer and you start now off and you hear this episode and you think, yes, let's start getting versatile and create my own versatility project. But yeah, how do you get there even? So first of all, you need time. Don't think about it that this will be something you do in one or two days. This is a roadmap. You need to know that versatility is part of continuous learning. That means we learn always, especially as developers, we have the tend to really, really, really need to get better and better with everything we do. And that's, that's really hard. And yeah, but what you can do is, for example, adding a, a tent to meetups. Something I did last week, last month, I think it's already quite a while. Sorry for that. I was at a game, yeah, a game development summit. Uh, I forgot the name here. It's a meetup that here in Karlsruhe is, and it was great. There were great people, very funny. There was beer, and the best part is you could talk with people and get their opinion and also understood what they are doing. So there was a lawyer, for example, who was not convinced that could be a threat for his job, or there have been game developers, game designers who had a very complete different problem set for uh, CICD pipelines or all these kinds of things. And besides of that, game developers are in general pretty cool because they have like gadgets I have never seen before. But all that led, is my journey for being more versatile. You know, I attend these meetups, I look, talk with them, I try to get their problems, their views and opinions. 
Yeah. Another thing is join like-minded groups. That means if you are, let's say, um, somewhere on Discord or on uh, something like that, try to be in a community that is active and that is more or less on your level. That means if you want to be versatile, search people who are also versatile, that also push you to new boundaries, that push you out of the comfort zone, as we say it always. That that helps you to, yeah, get more influence into your life and also pushes you, and in the best case, even gives you negative feedback, you know? Feedback is important, you know that? Feedback, I gave there a video about it, but it is even more important to get negative feedback and don't react directly to it because it's always easy to say, okay, I'm great. People think that I do a very good job, perfect. Especially I hate that with testimonials because they are just positive. I already search for the negative things because these are the things you can work on and on grow on. And I think that's part of the versatility. If you don't accept feedback, oh, whew, it's getting very difficult, I guess. If you are working in a team, you are already in a luxurious position, of course, but search for persons that are better than you, that have different topics than you, and maybe people who are, you can work with. So things like pair programming, extreme programming are super helpful with that because if there is a new framework, they can maybe give you insights that you have never heard about. If there is an old framework that you worked 10 years ago, try to hear and listen to new opinions. So if even if you have the youngest junior developer, they have crazy questions from time to time. That doesn't mean you should always listen to junior developers because they are also crazy confident with their stuff sometimes. So be careful there. <laughs> but in general, it's always good to have an open ear and also try to communicate open. So if you find something interesting, let them know. Invite them to talk about these topics. I think that's the best way to get more and more versatile. Another thing that I would suggest is doing different languages. Like if you are good in Flutter and Dart, you have already very good set to already start with a Java language or try C or C Sharp or any other backend language. Like in my case, it's at the moment Go that I want to learn. So that, that really helps you to get more understanding into different programming languages, different problems, what they are doing good, what they are doing bad, and also try to suggest to participate in things like lead code which at least increases your horizon in coding you know you don't have to solve them every day but if you watch at the problems you read again mathematical symbols which people usually don't often do in their lives then this helps you already to be up to date and the last part that i would suggest and this is one that i find really important because it helps tons to be participating in this is open source. There are so many open source projects and so many good developments and people around there and you can help at every open source project. They are usually very happy if you open up a PR, if you get some time into it, if you read into it. This really makes a difference, not only for the project itself, but also for yourself. Because I am pretty sure that most developers or uh, many developers have never participated in open source. What does that mean? Where do I start? What is a pull request? How does projects are working? All of these things are important. And if you know them, they make you automatically a better developer and also lead to less confusion if you are talking with other people. Yeah. But now it's your turn. I'm really interested. What do you think about this topic? So let me know down in the uh, comments below if there are well some. If you are listening while podcast or anything, please give me stars, give me a review. It would be amazing. Don't be too positive because then I can't improve. And you know, I know exactly that this podcast is not the best of the bests, but it's getting better with every episode. That is what I promise you here. Yeah, that's the conclusion. I love versatility. I am one of the persons that say from myself that I am a generalist and not so much a per specialist. I think uh, that I can say I love to be uh, in many different areas active and it helps me at a usual job. Like when I was a full stack developer, it always helped me that I know how CICD is working. It always helped me that I exactly know how business is working, that I could uh, talk with CIO and 
CEO and all the other stakeholders without getting panic attacks. And yeah, let me know how you see all of that. It would be fantastic to know for me. All right, as I said, there is a mentorship program. Check that one out. I will create more videos now. I am really happy and I really hope I can make soon again live streams. And don't forget next month between the 4th and the 7th July, I hope I got the dates now right, on fluttercard.dev you will find more infos. There will be the conference in Berlin. I will try to keep you up to date with new videos, new camera, with new, new things in general. I'm really excited. I hope that will be amazing. I really hope you liked the episode and yeah, that's it. Thanks for listening and see you the next time. Bye, your man.